Well, it's my uh, privilege to introduce to you our guest speaker today on our 58th anniversary. Uh, if you couldn't, I realized I, I didn't really, on the video I made, I didn't really have the levels well for the music and stuff. So if you have questions about Hillcrest Church, who we are, what do we believe, who are we a part of, next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock in my office, which is just down there, come on in. There's no strings attached. You can ask me whatever you want. And if it's a difficult question, I'll ask Sterling to answer it for you. So... But I just want to make myself available to answer whatever questions you have. Honestly, what do you believe in? Where does the budget go? If I give a tithe, what happens to it? Does it go to your special pastoral sauna that we have? No, we actually don't have one of those yet, but that's okay. I'd like to introduce uh, Kevin Vincent. If you'd come up here, Kevin is part of our uh, Atlantic Baptist Convention team. So uh, we are part of 450 churches across the Maritimes, Atlantic provinces. And so in Moncton, our head office is there and Kevin works uh, there for us. He has uh, been such a support to us as a church. In the last few years, I've been able to call on Kevin. He, if, you didn't, if you've never heard of Applehawk Baptist Church, a few years back, it started as just a small little church of, what, 11 people or so? Six. Is what I Six. Yeah. So I, I doubled the numbers. I guess that's, that's not so good. But God used uh, a vision that he put in Kevin's heart and used the leadership skills that he put in his heart uh, to grow a church into what's now known as Applehawk Community Church. And there's, a, there's several hundred people there, but numbers aren't the, the, the many, the numbers are an indicator of health and growth of things you know things that are healthy like my little plant in my office as it grows uh, it's a sign of health and so we've been able to call on Kevin and his experience to help us as a church over the last few years and he has always been willing to meet for coffee uh, give us some books to read meet with our leadership teams and so we thought it'd be appropriate on our anniversary service as we move ahead as a church and we're so excited about some of the changes uh, Troy's dad came and took apart all those pews he's taken them we want to repurpose these pews for God's glory so it's taken us a few weeks to get to where we are but uh, we're just so thankful for people uh, coming alongside anyhow Kevin you have a word of God for us this morning Thank you. Or please Thank you. have fun I'm gonna go here so that uh, I can move around maybe a little wow it's it is uh... What an honor to be here, really. What a privilege to be here this morning, to feel, uh, even as I came in this morning, there's such a sense of um, energy and enthusiasm and anticipation. And, uh, and so, and, and, and I've gone into churches where there's not always that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it is such a, a, a privilege, really, to be here uh, on this on this Sunday and to get a few minutes just to share, to share with you. You know, I got, I can, can I say this? You know, I love St. John, you know, I love, Saint, <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 you know, St. John, I, I, I grew up until I was about 12 or 13 here in the city and then, I mean, I love, you don't hear that a lot across Canada, right? Oh, I love St. John. I love St. John. To drive in here and look across, my dad worked at, was it Irving Tissue, it was Kimberly Clark, remember Kimberly Clark, some of you, he was there for most of his career and I could look across and see sort of a, the north, I'm a north ender, I apologize for that, uh, some of you north, okay, good, good, because uh, I've never been overly fond of west siders. Um, <laughs> Just, I mean, I, I grew up playing Central versus Lancaster hockey, and there's always that rivalry there. So, you know, you know that rivalry, yeah. So, uh, I'm a North Ender, grew up on Highland Road over there, went to Centennial School, and, and uh, yeah, there you go. And uh, so, I, I just really have a warm spot in my heart for, for St. John. I really do, I really do, um, I really love this, I really love this city. And now I'm in this new job, uh, spent a bunch of years in Appahawk and we're still living there. I'm in this new, I've told God, and I won't go into it this morning, I've told God on at least three occasions in my life, no, I've told God no three times at least, and it's never worked out for me very well. Uh, the last time I told, the last thing I said to God was I will never, God, be a, 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 a denominational guy, like one of them. I, 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 not that I don't love our family. We have a great family across this region. It's a, God is doing some amazing things in churches across Atlantic Canada. I love this family. I just didn't want to be one of them. Mainly because I'm kind of a pastor at heart, really. I love the local church. I love, I love having, you know, what I would call, I'm on a trip here this morning, you know that, right? I, I love having what I call my people. Just my people. Those are my people. And in this job, 
I don't really have my people the same way, right? So I, and I kind of miss that. It's been a big adjustment for me. So I'm going to say this morning, Andrew, these aren't your people, my people this morning. These are my people. <laughs> you're my people because I need people too, okay? So you're my people. And just so I don't forget, this is all prelude, okay? This is all prelude. Just so I don't, I don't forget, I want to say one more thing to you. And, and you know this, but I want to remind you of this because some of you can forget at times. You need to know this. You have a great pastor. Listen. You have, listen, you have a great, you have a great, you have a great pastor. Uh, Andrew and I have chatted a lot, as he alluded to, uh, over the, we've talked about you. <laughs> um, we, we, <laughs> we've talked about you over the years and, uh, and, and what God is doing here. He loves this church. He loves this city. He has a passion to see, to figure out what God's trying to do in neighborhoods all around Hillcrest Baptist Church. And you have a great, great, you have a great passion. Let me say this to you. When you have one, ah, ah, I probably know better than, I, I, I probably know better than some of you. They're not always easy to find. And so when you have one, you keep him. You love him, you cheerlead him, you encourage him, you go before him, you have his back where he leads you, follow. Just you, you, when you have a good pastor, you follow him because you have a great pastor here, folks. And I want to say that. So anyway. All right. Andrew, is that the way we practiced it? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Okay, let's jump in because I got a lot to say. Eleven o'clock, and I know. Yeah, so yeah, we're, we're going to get rolling here. I want to jump right in. You ready? Go like this. Stand up. Stand up, please. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody up. Okay, you can be seated. Uh, that's just to make sure that we're ready to go, uh, and and we're going to jump right in here because I got some things I want to share with you this morning. One of the one of the big commitments of my life is to not die with small vision. I'm 54 years old. And I know. I never want to lose my youthful idealism. I am 54 years old. I never want to get old. I'm, I'm 54 years old. I never want to become realistic. I am how old? Yeah, 54 years old. I never want to become logical. I'm 54 years old, and, 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 and I never want to begin to get to the point in my life where I start to reach conclusions about what I think God can do or can't do. Amen. The commitment of my life is to remain impractical and naive. Ah. <laughs> because really, that's what I see in the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul never grew up. The Apostle Paul never became realistic or rational or reasonable. The, the Apostle Paul never reached the point. He was always invigorated by the impractical. He always kept this, this, this he never under, under, underestimated the possibilities that could be experienced at the hands of a God with unlimited resources. Ah, I want to be that. I never want to reach the point where I think I'm checking out with small vision. I love Ephesians chapter, there it is there, Ephesians chapter 3. This was a good day for Paul when the Spirit uh, inspired him to write this. It says, God is able to do exceedingly abundant, more than you can ever ask. If you read different translations, I think the, the, the NIV says, God is able to do immeasurably more than you can ever ask or think. I think it's the New Living Translation that says, God is able to do infinitely more. Infinite is big. Infinitely more. Some of you remember the old King James, don't you? How many remember the old King James, right? We used to memorize everything. I still know my verses from the old King James. And the old King James, I think, at some points, says it best. And Paul, writing in the old King James, <laughs> says, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly. That's good. Because I can't think any bigger than that. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ever ask or think or conjure up on your very best day. I added that part. He's ex exceedingly abundantly more. Think about our forefathers and foremothers. We come from a history of dreamers, folks. 
We come from a history of dreamers. Over 200 years ago, our forefathers and foremothers landed on these Atlantic Canadian shores. And they cast this unimaginably large, God-sized vision for Atlantic Canada. They came with what I would say was an impractical and naive idealism about what a God with unlimited resources could do over 200 years ago. If someone would just join him in this region, and it happened here, they did it. They landed here. And, and, and they started going across the region. And they were, they were, I call them, they were like these church planting ninjas. <laughs> they would plant a church as far as a horse could go in February, right? That's what they did. They'd go, next community. Oh, no church here, plant. Next community, horse can't go that far, plant another church. And, 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 and the dream was so large, the vision was so huge. In fact, we are still living off of that legacy today. We come from a history of dreamers. But what you and I know is we're living in a new day. This is a new Canada. We've gone through some major, huge, unimaginable cultural shifts in the past 20, 30, 40 years. It's, a, it's time for a new legacy, folks. It's time, for, it's time for, for a new generation to stand up and say, you know, not on my watch is this thing going to go down. Not on my watch is, is my church going to decline. Not on my watch. We need a, a generation to stand up today and say, thank God for those forefathers and foremothers that have gone before us. Their vision le le lived on for generations, but it's time for our generation to say, who are we going to be? now? Who is God calling us in this day to be now? How does he want to reshape or shape his church in our day now? I don't want my three kids, 27, 25, and 22, I don't want them being forced to look back over 200 years to a legacy of the past. I want them to look back to our generation and say, those people were history makers. Those people heard God in a new place, in a new day, in a new time. And they, they, they are leaving for us an incredible church legacy of what God is, wants to do in Atlanta. Canada. It's a new day, folks. It's a new day. So let me give to you this morning, I could give you three, four, five, or six, but I'm going to give you two. I want to give you what I want to call two essential postures that I believe Hillcrest Church and churches all around Atlantic Canada and Christians all around our region, in fact, I would say across our nation, two essential postures that we must embrace if we are to see God do something new and fresh and big in this new day. Can we do that? Go like this. Yeah. Everybody's going like this? All right. No, nobody going like this. Everybody going like this. Okay. Let's do it. Okay, first one is this. Here's the first posture that we must embrace. The first posture is this. We must, folks, let me hear, hear me please. We must recapture, we must recapture our passion for evangelism. Paul was writing to the church at Corinth. It was in 1 Corinthians chapter Nine, and he was writing to them. He was reminding them under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He was reminding them of a whole lot of things. He was reminding them that it's not about them. <laughs> he was reminding them that the church does not exist for them. He was reminding them that the church was not established for them. He reminds them of the urgency of the task. He reminds them that people's lives and eternities are at stake. And he tells them in 1 Corinthians 9 that he is committed to doing whatever it takes. You can read it when you go home this afternoon, 1 Corinthians 9. But, 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 but he goes through it and he says to, he says to the, the Corinthian people, he said... I am willing to, to, to be like a Jew to win the Jews. I am willing to be like a Gentile to win the Gentiles. I am I am I'm willing to live as the rich if I need to live as the rich to reach the rich. I'm willing to live as a poor man to reach the poor. I, if, if I need to become weak, I will become weak. If I need to be strong, I will be strong. And then in verse 22 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says this. Some of you would know this verse. He says, I have become all things to all men and women so that by every possible means I might save some. Ah, yes, you can clap for that. 
I don't get that everywhere in Atlanta, Canada. <laughs> I become all things to all men and women so that by every possible means, that, that is a man driven by his passion to people, see people experience the glory of God and the transforming life that Jesus offers. I, um, I grew up going to Sandy Cove Bible Camp in the 1970s. Anybody Sandy Cove? Yeah. The Sandy Coast, Mr. Dean, Mr. Albert Dean days, right? I went to Sandy Cove in the 1970s. During my grandfather's day, if we looked across, we could have seen almost where the old Main Street Baptist Church was. My grandfather was there for, I don't know, ever. Uh, and during my grandfather's day and well into the 1970s, one of our favorite methods of evangelism and preaching was using guilt as a tactic and fear as a motivator. <laughs> Remember those days? Hell yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And we got great response. At Sandy Cove Bible Camp, every Thursday night it was movie night. Oh. And so at each night of camp, there would be an opportunity for young people to respond to Christ and to make Jesus Savior and Lord of their lives every night. Friday night was always banquet night, and Friday night was the day that most of the guys, and probably the girls as well, were thinking about who am I going to ask to the banquet on Friday night so that they, Mr. Dean knew that Friday night evangelistically was really a lost cause because none of us were on Jesus, our, our minds were on Jesus, they were on the girl that we wanted to ask to the banquet. So really, Thursday night became the last key night to, to, to present the message of Jesus and have young people respond to Christ on Thursday night. So it was always movie night. So Thursday night would be movie night. They would bring us all together. They would take us down into the basement of that, of that lodge. They would uh, turn the lights off. They'd give us popcorn, and they'd show movies on this Thursday night. It was always the real big-budget Christian movies of the 1970s, right? <laughs> remember some of those? Oh, they're good movies. You remember some of them? Uh, Thief in the Night. Remember Thief in the Night, right? Um, uh, Thief in the Night was a mark of the beast, right? My personal favorite was Run, Joey, Run, right? All of the very best 666 movies that you could find in the 1970s. All of those movies, if you remember watching them, some of you remember seeing them, they all would, they would start with a little bit of a different storyline, but the storyline would always twist and the movie would always end the same way, always. So I can remember watching, uh, watching those movies, uh, and, 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 and it was the, the rapture, uh, as the movie would uh, show it, the rapture had taken place, uh, the, the Christians had, had been taken out of this world, and, and then the tribulation was, was, was now occurring in these movies, and, 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 and there were some of those that had, had refused to take the mark of the beast, right? They would not receive on their forehead or on their wrist this mark of the beast because they finally had, waken, had, had awakened to the fact that Jesus Jesus was who he said he was, and so they wouldn't receive the mark of the beast. And, and, and so, so the movie would, at the end, would, would gather all of these folks that would not take the mark of the beast, would line them up. So we're watching it on the screen. It would line them up in front of this great big guillotine, big knife. This is, this is, this is grade seven, right? Grade seven. <laughs> seven, eight, nine, right? Great big knife. It would line all of those folks up. It would, it would, it would, it would one at a time, they would come up to this guillotine because they were going to be martyred for their faith. Some of you remember that. They would put their head down into the guillotine. Over to the side, there would be a guy holding a rope. It would hold, he would pull the rope. And on the screen, we'd go, ah, as the knife started to come down, and then the screen would go black, right? The movie was over. <laughs> Middle school. So the green screen would go black. After uh, the room was black, the lights would come back up. The lights would come back up, and Mr. Dean, Mr. Albert Dean, would be standing at the front of the, up by the altar. He'd say, uh, whew, that's a rough way to go, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he said, uh, some of you probably need Jesus, don't you? <laughs> you'd have an invitation we'd all go front, up front you know I got saved every summer every <laughs> summer I can think five or six years you can't, I'd say it's just not worth the risk I'm going ahead <laughs> I'm going up to that front because I need Jesus again I say all right. <laughs> 
You know, I, I question a little bit the strategy now. It's probably not the technique that I would use, but listen, here's what I don't question. I do not question Mr. Dean's or my grandfather's passion for who they would call lost and dying souls. I'll never question that. Lost and dying souls. They understood that life without Jesus meant an eternity without hope and a present without meaning. They understood that. You know, there's nine million millennials, the millennial generation living across our nation. You add Generation Z to them, and, and we have about 40% of the Canadian popula population under the age of 36. If the millennials come out to vote in a few weeks, they can change the history of this nation because that's the largest, largest voting block now that is alive. Lots of them won't vote. But if they do, they can change the direction of this, of this nation. They can shape our country's future. And oftentimes I'll go into churches and, 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 and the folks in church, I'll meet them afterwards and they kind of moan and complain and say, ah, oh, you know what, the young people have left the church. Young people have left the church. They don't care about the church anymore. They, they don't want to be here in the church anymore. And I say, no, 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 that's where you're wrong. Young people have not left the church. We are living in a day, ladies and gentlemen, where they have never showed up yet. They've never showed up. They're not angry. They're not ticked off. They're not frustrated. They just look too often at the church and they simply don't care because they see it as irrelevant for their lives. But they haven't left. And they're not angry. In fact, the church at its best is, offers to them what they so deeply need. The church and Jesus at its best, at his best, offers to them a life of hope and joy and meaning and peace and community because many are lonely and community because they're experiencing so much anxiety. It offers to them a place to serve and to make a difference in the world. It offers to them all that they're looking to be and all that they're looking to do. It offers to them what Jesus said. You'll remember many of you in John 10.10 10, when he said, I have come that you might have life and you might live it to the very best. You might live it to the fullest. I have come. The reason that I left the side of the Father was to come down into this place so that you can experience life at its very, very best. And that was not just for the boomers. That's for the millennials and that's for the Gen Z and for every generation that's ever breathed. He said, I've come to give you life and life to its very fullest. Life to its fullest. I become all things, Paul said, to all men and women so that by every possible means I might save some. Do you feel the weight of that? Do you feel the weight of that? Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not making a plea for a return to evangelism strategies of the past. I'm, you know, we're not going to gather after church this morning after you have some fish. And, and like my grandfather did on Sunday afternoons, we're not going to head out on the west side, start knocking on doors and do some soul winning, as they used to call it, right? I'm not going to go out with our four spiritual laws track in our back pocket. I'm not going to do that. And we're not going back to the, the powerful days of Billy Graham with crusade evangelism. We're not going back in our nation probably to that. So don't hear what I'm not saying, but what I am saying is this. Can we begin to recapture a, a, a pa the passion of Mr. Dean and my grandfather? Can we begin to, to recapture and, and understand that if, that, if, that if Jesus Christ has changed your life, are you passionate about your story? Are you just simply passionate about what Christ has, has, has done in your life? Is it more in our day simply about extending some friendship? Is it more in our day simply about extending some, some hospitality and, and some kindness? Is it more about day extending love to those neighbors that we come in contact with and, and modeling a deep sense of, 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 of winsomeness that eventually earns the right to be heard? And we have this opportunity just to share what God has done, what Jesus has done in our life. We're just sharing our good story is all we're doing. Here's what Jesus has done in my life. 
and we earn that right to be heard. Do we feel the weight of that? Or how about this? How about not just personally? How about the Hillcrest Baptist Church as a congregation? What would it look like if Hillcrest was to begin to experiment with maybe some new environments? To reimagine, what would it look like if, 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 if Hillcrest started to, to reimagine what, what church might look like in a new day? What would it, what would it look like if, if Hillcrest started to reimagine what might church, what might be meaningful for that under 36 crowd? What might be meaningful in our day for them? What might be meaningful for those, that generation who is less and less and less and less likely to engage in something like this? But what would it look like for them? Can we begin to dream? Can we begin to imagine? Can we begin to embrace sort of a spirit of experimentation where we just start trying stuff and see if some of that begin, begins to, to gain some traction because the Spirit of God is in it and we're, we're moving into a place that God has already been and we're just joining Him there. Huh? What would it look like if it was a cafe church or a dinner church on a Thursday night? What would that look like? You know, Andrew has shared with me, we were together a few weeks ago, and he was sharing with me how you're asking those questions. So you're ahead of me. You're, you're, you're asking those questions. What do we need to do to, to do what God has called us to do better? I know you had my good friend Pastor B here a while ago. He'll energize a place. <laughs> I know that over that time, you were able to determine and, and, and sort of uncover maybe eight or nine or ten sort of priority changes, priority areas that need to begin to shift within the congregation here. Changes in worship and the level of excellence maybe with which you do certain things. Changes in the auditorium. Some of that is happening already it's with the pews and and, 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 and how, do we, how do we create even a more compelling environment that people would want to engage in? And what about our, you know, how do we assimilate people? How do we care for people? How do we connect with people? How do we do some of those things better? What about our social, social media connections and website? And how do we do that? I know that you're looking at sort of eight or ten new areas where you say, we need to begin to do some of these things and we need to begin to do these things better and do these things well if we're going to be the church that God is calling us. It's also critical. Andrew and I were having <coughs> coffee the second cup one day, and, and, and he was sharing all of this with me, and I was kind of getting excited about what he's saying. He's like, oh, that's, that's so cool. And God's doing something, and, and, and the congregation is so open to that. That's wonderful. And he was sharing all of this, and, 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 then, and, and then the conversation slowed down for a minute, and then Andrew kind of leaned in. He said, but here's what I know. And so I leaned in. <laughs> what do you know? He said, here's what I know. All of that is critical, he said. We got to do all of that. Those eight or ten areas are going to be essential for us to do. But then he said, but none of that is what I would call a real step of faith. None of that is, 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 is oh, he said, it'll be painful for some, and it's going to push up against some Certainly some personal preferences that some of us might have. Some of us aren't going to like all of it. But he said, it's not a real step of faith. I'm like, well, okay, well, <laughs> what's the real step of faith? He said, that's not, that's not stepping into what the song says that you probably sing here, stepping into the oceans of faith. He said, that's just recognizing that we have a ship here in the St. John Harbor. <laughs> and the ship that we have has lots of buildup on it. Got some barnacles on it. The bottom of the ship needs to be clean. We need to wipe it down, scrape it off, get some of those barnacles. It's going to cut some of us. Some of it's going to hurt as we try to get those barnacles off because they're sharp. That's just recognizing that we have a, a ship here in the St. John Harbor and there's barnacles and it's got to be cleaned up. He said, it, it's really important ship maintenance. We have to do it. Those eight or ten, we have to do it. But it's not a step into the oceans of faith where God is calling us. You have a great pastor. 
I said, well, what is that then? Andrew said, I wrote this down, Andrew, so because it was so good. He said, to fulfill our mission in this city, we're going to need some new crews. We're going to need some new ships. We're going to need some new lifeboats. He said, we're going to we're going to need some new ways to reach into a culture that will never walk through these doors. We're going to need to step out into the oceans of faith. And he said, together as a church, we're going to figure that out. We're going to figure that out. He and I both, he and I both have a sense that, that somehow that could relate to this church's heart for, for, for refugees and immigrants and internationals that are landing on this shore, on these shores. You have a heart for that. God's doing some wonderful things as it relates to that here. He and I both believe that some of it may, may relate to that. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a pizza church at a Lebanese pizza shop. Maybe, maybe it's partnering with other churches, maybe even other denominations. Imagine that. Maybe it's, imagine, maybe it's partnering with, with other churches and denominations and establishing some sort of an off-site gathering, maybe an off-site kind of congregation somewhere, some micro-congregation or, or sort of fresh expression of what the church could look like in this day. Maybe not even on Sunday. And you would probably go and think, I can't go there. That's not my church. I don't like that. But maybe it's church for them what's that going to look like and would it be okay would it be okay if Hillcrest started to consider how can we begin to multiply maybe some other micro type congregations or, or we start multiplying maybe some fresh expressions of church around the city and would it be okay if those people started gathering in those places and they never showed up on Sunday but eventually someday we met up in heaven together <laughs> Could that be okay? Don't go like this too quickly because that's a big shift. That's a big shift. Would that be okay? Could that be the big ocean of faith that God is calling this church out into that goes beyond what happens in here and begins to move out there? That's the evangelistic posture. In this day, in our times, I believe God is calling us to embrace. I'll become all things to all men and women so that by every possible means, I might save some. That's exciting. That's exciting. How do we reshape the church today for what God is doing in our city because he loves this city? That's posture number one. That's posture number one. The second posture is where my grandfather would say, oh, now you've gone from preaching to meddling. <laughs> so. If we are to leave a legacy for our, of our generation in this region for the future of the church in Atlantic Canada. If we are to be an exceedingly abundantly more people in St. John at Hillcrest Baptist Church, not only do we need to embrace and recapture a deep sense our evangel of an evangelistic posture, we secondly need to do this. We need to renounce our personal preferences. I touched on that a little bit already. You know, I always say, <laughs> uh, how many are parents here? How many are parents? You see, yeah, good parents understand this. Good parents understand this. As soon as that child is dropped into your life, you understand that life is no longer about you. Right? Yeah, that's what happens. Right? Your time is not yours. Your money is not yours. Your food is not yours. Your computer is not yours. Your vacation, not yours. Your car, eventually not yours. Right? Hey, guys, what about your tools? No, not yours. Hey, parents, good parents understand this. You know, I was... Um, I was ticked off about it. Here's a, I was ticked off about a year ago. Uh, you know, my 22-year-old son, who's now he just finished uh, about three months ago at RCMP Depot in uh, in Regina. He's now in Athabasca, Alberta, up north as a 22, 22, 23-year-old, whatever he is. Uh, I always lose track of their ages. Uh, he's 22. Um, just so you know, the moms are thinking, oh, he doesn't even know his children's age. 22. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 
about a year ago, he was still living at home, and, and, and one day, uh, I couldn't find my socket set. Darn. I didn't know where it was, but I know who'd taken it. I knew Josh had taken it. So, oh, he's not home. Where's my socket set? I need my socket set. I'm looking for my socket set. I go to his F-150. I look in it. Not there. Can't find it there. Go to the baby barn. Not there. Can't find my socket set. Down to the basement into my little workshop there. Not there. Looked all over the place. Where's my socket set? I'm getting angrier and angrier and angrier because I knew that that kid had used it and hadn't put it back where he was supposed to. I'm getting angrier about this socket set that I can't find. In the midst of all of this, the phone rings. I'm I'm mad at the phone. <laughs> I pick up the phone. It's my father. My father lives like just across the yard, just a stone's throw across the yard. My, it's my father, and he could tell that I was a little bit perturbed. He, he said, oh, he said, listen, I can tell, you know, you got something going on there. Uh, he said, I, I won't keep you long. He said, I, I just have one question for you. He said, I can't find my power washer. I said, um, I, I, I'll bring it right over. <laughs> he said, as a parent, you know nothing is yours. You don't resent it. You just know that it's true. You know what? It doesn't matter. Do you know why? Because you understand that this role that you've been given by God is way bigger than you. You understand that these children have been entrusted to you. They're a gift that has been given to you. You understand that God has given to you this role of, of shaping and molding these young lives into the people that God is calling them to be. You understand that, that that's your role. So, so what do you do? You renounce your own personal preferences. You renounce your own desires. You renounce your own wants. And you do it, what? You do it for your kids. And across this region, across this region, across the west side, we need followers of Jesus who will take the same posture, that will renounce their own personal preferences for the sake of the kingdom because they understand that it's not really all about them. If we're to leave a legacy of faith, for the generations that follow us. You know, Paul is the role model. I become all things to all men and women so that by every possible means I might save some. Translation, it's not about you. Huh? It's not about you. It's really nothing to do with you. It's all about what is, where is God working? What is God doing? And who is he calling us to be and to stay? And where is he calling us to serve? And in what neighborhood is he calling us? What's he calling us to reach out? It's not about you. Oh, I can share one more story, can I? Go like this. <laughs> one more story. We, um, some of you would know, and Andrew kind of alluded to it as he sort of welcomed me this morning. It was my privilege to serve a little Appahawk church for 20 years. We came back in 1996 to replant that tiny little Appahawk church. We had there when we started what I called the original six. It was our original six. Faithful older saints. They all were in their 70s and 80s. Actually, that's not true. Ruth, Ruth was in her mid-50s and we called Ruth the youth group. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was, there was Mildred and George and Gladys and Muriel and Jean, and there was a, the original six. Um, Mrs. Holmes, Mildred Holmes, had, she was in, close to being in her 90s when I showed up. She walked on two canes. Her legs weren't great. She still drove, although she shouldn't probably never have driven because she's a terrible driver. <laughs> Um, and I told her that. Uh, uh, she'd been the organist for 47 years. Faithful, faithful. Mrs. Holmes. I love Mrs. Holmes. Some of you may have even heard me share this story because it's so relevant, really, to what we're talking about this morning. 
When, when we first started, it was September 1st, uh, first, second week of September 1996. I had known Mrs. Holmes. I'd grown up in Appahawk, and so uh, I'd known Mrs. Holmes much, much, most of my life. And so she was my first visit. <laughs> I went in to see Mrs. Holmes on a Monday afternoon. We had a lovely visit. She took me into her home. It's a beautiful, older home, and, and she lived there on her own in her late 80s, 90 or so. And, and uh, we had a great visit. She made me some lovely tea. She always had really good cookies. And, uh, and so we had this visit. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm like every good pastor. I had a visit for maybe half an hour or so with Mrs. Holmes. And, and uh, so I was sitting down and, 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 and said to her, why don't I close in prayer? And she said, uh, yeah, why don't you have a word of prayer? So I had a word of prayer. And then I stood up to leave. And she said, sit down. <laughs> I was 31, she was almost 90, I sat down. <laughs> and anyway, she said to me, she said, you know, um, you need to know this. I've always liked you. <laughs> now, when someone starts that way, <laughs> there's a sense it's not going to end that way, right? <laughs> you know there's a butt coming. I've always liked you. She said, I've known you since you were just this high. I followed you. I knew that you'd make something of yourself, she said. But <laughs> she said, I love what you're doing. She said, I think if anything, anybody could come in here and help to change this Appahawk church and turn things around and see God do something here, I think that you would be the one. I believe that that's the truth. But, she said, she said I can't go to church in a school. We'd made the decision that, that we weren't going to meet in this little Appahawk church. We were going to move just 100 meters down the road to the little elementary school. There was, you know, we had there that, that, that little 40 by 60 rural church that's speckled all across Atlantic Canada. You know the ones you walk in and, and there's just a little entrance and, and there's the red Baptist carpet down the middle. And then, and then it's like you, you, step into the, you step into the foyer, you step into the auditorium, one, two, three, and you're at the front, you know? That's right. You know, so they're 40 by 60 or so, something like that. We didn't have running water. There's, you know, a big old oil furnace in the back. When that kicked in, you couldn't hear anything, which sometimes was preferable depending on how good the preaching was. Um, <laughs> So she said, I can't go to church in school. She said, what's wrong with our little church? She said, I grew up in that little church. We, had, we, 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 would, we would be there. We, we, we would have, she said, Sunday school there before church started. We would have five classes in that one room. She'd have, we'd have one up there on the left side by, the, by, the, by, by, by where the choir sang. And then on the right side, we'd have another class at the back by the coat hanger. She said, we'd put a class there. And then back in by where the oil furnace is, she'd, she, we'd have a class there. And then we'd stick another class in the middle. She said, it was never a problem. You know, children were a lot better in those days, you know. <laughs> I said, oh, I know parents nowadays, Mrs. Holmes, parents nowadays. She said, what's wrong with that? I said, well, Mrs. Holmes, um, you know what families are like today, and they have high expectations. You know, they, they expect that there would be a bathroom, <laughs> running water. And, oh, really? She said, we just had our kids go before they left, and then when they came home, they could go again. I said, well, you know all about expectations of young parents today, Mrs. Holmes. She said, well, I guess so. I said, well, you know, they expect to have running water. They, they expect, they expect, they expect. And, and we just really feel that, that this, little, this little church here, given some of the expectations of these younger generations, that we're not going to be able to really reach into the families that we would really like to reach into and begin to attract those families and, and children to this, this church. And so I went on and waxed kind of eloquently and said that we think this and this and this is why and this is why and this is why. And this is why we're doing this. And she said, well, I don't, I don't like, I don't like, I don't like going, I don't want to go to a school to church. And I said, well, you know what, Mrs. Holmes, really? Me either. I don't either. She said, really? I said, no. I don't want to go to church in a school. I said, you know what that means? That means every Friday night, I got to go down with my key. I got to open the door. I got to go in. I got to go into the gymnasium. I got to get out chairs. I got to set up all the chairs every Friday night. She said, you shouldn't have to do that. I said, I know. I said, you know more than that? You know what I got to do? I have to go in and not after I, set, after I set up the chairs, we have to get out a sound system. We got to set up a sound system so that everybody can hear because they expect to be able to hear. And then we got to go over and we got we to set up a nursery. We're going to set up a nursery where, kids, where all the kids in school hang their coats. And we, I got to do that every week. She said, you shouldn't have to do that. I said, I know. I said, you know what? More than that, Mrs. Holmes, you know what I have to do? On Sunday after church, I got to tear it all down again. Get ready for the next Friday. She said, you shouldn't have to. I said, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> I 
So Mrs. Holmes, you know why we're doing it? It's because some of these expectations that we think some of these families have. They want a good place for their kids. They want a nice classroom for their kids. They want to be able to hear and be able to flush a toilet. <laughs> she said, oh, I hear you. I hear you. And I think, ah, oh, I think she's hearing me. And then she said, I hear what you're saying, but I can't go to church in a school. <laughs> she was there the first week. Uh, she could not not be there the first week. She just would be, and this is not a criticism of her, I'm the exact same way. She could not not be because she'd just be a little too nosy to see what happened. <laughs> she was there the first week. She came the second week because on the second week I went to her and I said, listen, we want to honor you. When I was visiting with her, she said, you know, one thing you need to know, I've been the organist 47 years and, 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 and I'm going to retire. I'm going to re retire from that position now. And I took that as quick as I could, that resignation, because um, she really wasn't even that good, really. Um, <laughs> And it was an old pump organ, you know, pump organ she played. So I took that. So on, the, on week two, we wanted to honor her. 47 years, 47 years. She's a hero of mine. We, so we wanted to honor her. We, so we, we had a little social time afterwards, and we made some of those little asparagus sandwiches, and that stuff you have, you know, those funeral sandwiches. We had some of those. Uh, I hate them, but, but we had those. She loved them. And we had sandwiches, and we had tea because she loved tea. And during that time, we brought her up, and we had a, a plate that we'd engraved for her, this plate. And we brought her up and, and took a picture of her, put it in the old Atlantic Baptist, if some of you remember that, that day. We, we honored her. Why? Because she really deserved it. 47 years. The place was still going because of Mrs. Holmes, really. We honored her. Week two, she came. You know why she came? Because she had to receive the plate. Week three, she came back again. This is three weeks now. She came back. You know why? Because she'd written a thank you note. And she wanted to give it to me <laughs> for the plate. And so I read it that day. You know what? By then, she was in a habit. And she never missed. I mean, there was, she was on two canes. So during January and February, when it was icy, she couldn't risk it. But when the weather was good and she could drive, she was there. And she would be at the back of this gym. And she would sit there during the service. She hated it. She hated it. And she didn't like the music. She didn't like the fact that her pastor didn't wear a tie. She didn't like the fa In those days, at least I tucked in. I don't even tuck in now. <laughs> Imagine. Uh, I know I've some have offended some of you already. Thankfully, Andrew's the same. Uh, 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 I just called him out. Um, so, uh, and, and so... And, 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 and so she didn't like any of it. The music was terrible. The, the room was terrible. The chairs were bad. I'd visit her all the time. She'd tell me every time. But she never missed. And she would get up at the end of the service. She would be the first one out. When I went out to the door, like we did in those days, and I'd shake her hand. And she would come up, and she would give me a great big hug. And she said, I love seeing all the children here. I love seeing all the children here. She hated it. But she loved seeing all the children. Mrs. Holmes is one of my heroes. She could have mucked it up. She had the influence. She could have mucked it up, but she didn't. And neither did George, neither did Gladys, and neither did Mildred, and neither did Muriel, and neither did Bertha, the original six. They had a deep sense that they were willing to renounce their own preferences because they saw that God was up to something bigger than them. I tell you, I still tell their story. Why? Because they're still my heroes. And I will cheerlead them to my final breath. And my guess is that maybe we need some heroes even here. Some of you with real voices of influence that will stand and say, you're not even sure. I don't even like that, I don't think. I don't even think I like it. But maybe it has some kingdom potential. And because of that, even though I don't like it, I recognize it's not about me and I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to embrace it. How many of you, I, I asked before, how many have children again? How many have grandchildren? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, how many of you have children or grandchildren that, that aren't living in this city now? Right. And how many of you have children and grandchildren not living in the city that are living somewhere else in another part of Canada and they don't go to church? Exactly. Let me tell you this. Here's what, here's what I know. Those of you that just raise your hands with kids or grandkids living somewhere else in this country that aren't going to church, I know this. You would give your left arm for a church in that community wherever those grandchildren are, that would do whatever it takes to reach your kids, to reach your... You cut off your right arm, probably both for that. And here's what I also know. There are children and grandchildren living in streets and in houses all over the west side 
They're not going to church. And they have some parents. They have some grandparents living in other parts of this country. And those grandparents would cut off their left arm for a church on the west side of St. John that would do whatever it takes to reach their kids. A church that recognizes that it's not about them, but a church that says it's all about what is God up to and where can we join him and where is he working in, in, in this neighborhood. A church that's willing to say with Paul, I will do all things. I will do all things. I will do all things, whatever it takes. I will become all things to all men and women, to all boys and girls, to all teenagers, young people, whatever the generation. I will do all things, become all things, that I might win some. That I might win some. Here's what I know. Here's what I think I know. I think I know that's your heart. Andrew and I have chatted long enough now. Now oh, there's bumps in church, isn't there? There's bumps in church. Whenever you get people together, there's bumps. There's bumps in church. But here's what I think I know. There's a new coming together and a new passion and a new energy in this place. And God is up to something. And he's asking you to join him, to renounce your own preferences, to embrace that recaptured evangelistic posture, to do whatever it takes to reach out to this neighborhood and where God has planted you. That's, that'll get you up every day. That'll get you up. There's nothing more exciting or history changing than that. Lord, we give you thanks. God, you are so good. Lord, you've, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have called us into this incredible, incredible mission, this incredible kingdom that you are building. We thank you, God. We're humbled that it's not our kingdom, it's your kingdom, and we're humbled that you've called us in to work with you. God, we know it's not about us, and we know the stakes are high. And we just simply want to do what you're calling us to do, to be who you're calling us to be. That's our prayer. And we unite in that, and everyone said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Kevin, so much for speaking into our lives. Just thinking about uh, Dawn Star, your story. You know, your, your mother's out in Ontario, and she would have cut her left and right arms off, and... and uh, you know, God reached out to you, and now you're part of our congregation. And there's, there's a lot of things that we can be doing as a church, and I really appreciate the way you spoke in our lives, Kevin. Uh, next week, I'm going to be start to teach on what it means to be a people of faith. What it means to be a people of faith. And I think God's given me some really strong messages. Uh, and then we'll, uh, before we get into our Christmas season, so uh, next week I'm going to talk about squishy grapes. Because, you know, I, I compare church to a bag of grapes. You know, you, you go in and, and you're looking for good fruit. But what happens when you get a squishy grape? How do you move forward again? How do you choose to put your hand back in the bag again if you've had squishy grapes? And what does it mean? So that's a little taste for, of, of grapes for next week's message. But I'm going to talk about if God is going to call us into the deep waters of faith, you need to know, first of all, what it means to be a person of faith. So I hope that you'll come out with us, uh, come hear the message next week. Um, some, Sue's going to say grace afterwards for the meal. And uh, please, I won't be at the back door this week because I'm going to be first in line for the fish. <laughs> or maybe the last, first comes last, I don't know. So.